Outrocast. Barrett, I'm going to say good afternoon or is it good morning because you're on the west side of the country? Uh, it's good morning. I'm in my uh, my hotel room in Hot Springs, California. <laughs> There's worse places to be. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It, it's a pretty overwhelming tour schedule that you got because you have to be on your game for the actual performance. You have to do press. You're talking up a book. You're talking up music, et cetera. So thank you for taking the time. And let's talk about the book, not your first book. So when I ask a lot of people, how long did it take you to write the book? And if they're like 42, they go 42 years. Uh, in your case, how long did it take you to write this book? Uh, I wrote this Screaming Trees book in about, uh, well, a couple of years working on it off and on. Technically, okay, so it's my fourth book. Right. Um, and I started writing the stories for the book back in about 2000, 2015, because I was working on my first book about music around the world. And of course I had to write about Seattle and all the bands I'd played with and that whole music scene. And as I was writing the stories, they kept going and going and I'd write a story and I'd be like, Oh yeah, that reminded me of this. And, and then I realized, man, I've written, you know, half a book of stories about the screaming trees and I can't put them <laughs> all in this one book about music around the world. So I just kind of tabled them. And then when Mark Lanigan was writing his book, Sing yes. Backwards and, and Weep, he would call me and, um, you know, we've stayed friends this whole time. In fact, we were working on projects together right before he passed away. And he, he, he would call me and say, like, do you remember this particular event? What do you remember about that? And I'd tell him and then he'd be like, God, that's not what I remember. Do you, you know, how, do you remember this? And I wouldn't remember that. And, we would just laugh like hyenas, <laughs> you know, like we have post rock and roll dementia and we can't remember. <laughs> not, not as bad as say Motley Crue where the dirt has so yeah. many inaccurate things about their history. And yeah. then each of their memoirs have different recollections of the same things again, wrong. So <laughs> I would say you at your worst is probably still better than Motley Crue. Well, I will say this, like, 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 uh, Lanigan's book is actually really good and very accurate. Yes. I mean, there are a few minor things like, oh, we had a different tour manager on that tour, you know, but, you know, they, it all blurs together anyway. And I I had my book read and, and checked by, you know, like Gary Lee Connor, who was also in the Screaming Trees, you know, he's the founder, the guitar player. He loved it. He thought it was very accurate. Our old manager read it, our tour manager read it, you know, a bunch of musicians that we played with, like, Duff McKagan and Mike McCready and Peter Buck, they all read parts of it. So that, you know, like I got feedback from everybody as to like, you know, how how the stories, but, you know, to be honest, the stories were written to be like little short comedic slices of what it was like to be in the Screaming Trees. It's not the kind of book that Mark wrote. I, I And Mark encouraged me to write the more humorous side because that's more my personality anyway. And well, so I tried tried to write it like, here's what happened. You know, you know, this is a true event that happened, but here's like, you know, a more humorous way to look at the situation. A notable thing that you just stepped over right there, as you said, Peter Buck, Duff McKagan, Mike McCready, you mean three guys that you were in super groups with outside of the Screaming Trees, yeah. outside of your master's degree, aside from the films you scored, aside from the books okay. you've written. So you've always been a go-getter. Now, does that come out of not wanting to be bored and boring or is it just somebody offers you something you say yes and you don't realize that you also had another 10 things going on? I I am, I'll say yes to just about any invite, you know? I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm realistic about like, can I actually do that in my schedule? But I've always had that, it's kind of like the Jim Carrey movie, Yes Man, where he says yes to every, absolutely everything. Yeah. And so, but when you do that, you end up having this incredible adventure like this last summer, I got asked to be on a sailing team with these green berets that have a they have a sailing team. And we we did the race to Alaska where we literally sailed from Washington to Alaska in a 34 foot sailboat. And you couldn't have an engine in it. You could only sail or row. We thought it would take us, you know, five days or a week. And it took us a month. And. It was an incredible experience. I mean, just magical. And and I became like kind of best friends with these guys. And they, they invited me to join their sailing team. 
And if I hadn't said yes to that, I would have never had that experience. You know, I would have just probably stayed home all summer and I would have done something, but you know, you, you got to say, you gotta say <laughs> yes, say yes to life. You got to do it. Now you mentioned before, this is more humorous book than Mark's book. Yeah. And Something that I'm finding is the more serious the band from Seattle or related to Seattle, the more serious their music was, the funnier they were. So, for example, when you talk to Kevin Martin from Candlebox, he can't be serious for more than 15 seconds. Big smile on his face. Yeah, I'm finding it might have been a marketing thing to make Seattle this gloomy place when in reality it's the comedy <laughs> mecca of music. You might be right about that. I mean... I I'm trying to think. I mean, I, I know the mud honey guys, they are like Mark, Mark is hilarious. Yeah, he is a quick wit, man. He's fast. Like you can't hardly keep up with him. And uh Kim Thiel is an old friend of mine. He's super funny. Um I don't, I mean, I don't know every musician in every band, but I would say, like, you know, the the smartest ones are the funniest ones. I mean, that's just the truth, you know. Um, I also think that I mean, humor is a way to show. Well, like what they say, tragedy or humor is tragedy plus time, right? Yeah. So obviously there's a lot of tragedy in Seattle. All the people we lost um, to overdoses and just untimely death. And that's not funny. However, you can tell stories about those people and you can find a funny way. And it, I don't know, I think it touches people's hearts in a different way. You know, if you're just like serious all the time and everything is this, you know, hard, pragmatic. I mean, that's not that's not that fun. That's not a book I'd really want to read, you know, Probably. and you you can, you can, I mean, my book has some, you know, kind of hard topics, you know, because those are things that happened in the screaming trees. And, right. um, but you can talk about them if you set it up, you know, you've created a, a, a platform of levity. Right. Well, it, Screaming Trees, my exposure to the band was being a big MTV person, 120 minutes. I think you were a buzz clip band. Yeah, we had a buzz clip and we yeah. also we also did a whole bunch of um, I mean, we did that MTV Alternative Nation tour, which was actually kind of grueling and <laughs> wasn't very alternative. Yeah, um, MTV was super low budget until yeah. maybe Total yeah. Request Live that era. So where I was going with that is in that era or a couple of years after the buzz clip stuff, I remember you did the Oasis tour with the Manic Street Preachers where you're yeah. playing sheds and all that. Yeah. So it's been interesting to see how you went from kind of indie band to the next big thing, MTV band, to it didn't work out, but we're still legendary. And now you fast forward that time. And yeah. probably if there were a Screaming show, uh, Tree sh show tomorrow, it would be to the biggest crowds you've ever played. You know, it's oh, that kind yeah. of thing where... MTV was not the peak in terms of your influence. So when did you kind of start to notice that like, hey, we're a legacy band for the rest of my life. This is great. As opposed to I used to be in the Screaming Trees. Well, um, there is a chapter in my book called Reunion. And in 2015, that's exactly what happened, what you just described. You know, the Screaming Trees are considered this legacy band. In fact, we've been moved from our old label to Sony Legacy Recordings, which is where they put Miles Davis and Bob Dylan and, you know, like- Even the, Alice in Chains is there too, yeah. Oh, they're on there too, good, they should be yeah. because we were, yeah, we we're both Sony bands at the same time. And what happens is, um, so we got some offers to play festivals at, in the, I, I mean, it was, I think the offers came in 2015 and the shows would have been in 2016 and it was huge amounts of money. And like way more than we ever could have imagined. And Mark and I talked about this and we were like, do we want to do this? And, you know, maybe, you know, let's, you know, anyway, this for, for the better part of a year, we talked about doing it and we fielded offers and our booking agent said people all over the world were putting offers in to have us play festivals. And, you know, but when we really thought about it, we thought, well, every band that we know is doing that and getting back together and, you know, going out and making huge amounts of money. And even though the trees were never at that level back in the day, we did have this big influence as, as songwriters. Yeah. Like, I think that's what we're known for. We're like songwriters, album makers, and, and that was our legacy. And we all just kind of thought maybe we should leave it at that because we've all, at that point, we'd all gone on to do su such different things that it wouldn't, 
it would be kind of stepping backwards to do that. So we ended up not, you know, taking any of those offers and we decided not to do the legacy band thing. And I think that's to maybe more to our ongoing legacy that we didn't do that because then it just allows people to remember those albums and those shows they saw when they were 22 years old or whatever. Yeah. I think we've seen the same trajectory with every band that had a hit between say 92 and 99, where they yeah. regroup, they make more money than they ever did on that usually festival or bigger than they were run of theaters or something like that. That's exactly and everyone's like, this is great. We're back. They make the reunion album, the next tour, the attendance is a little lower and the reviews weren't so great on that album. And the next tour it's a little lower. And then they go, wait, are we weekend warriors like warrant and firehouse? Right. Or, uh, do we want to do the half legacy thing or is this over? So then they end it and then they come back again five years later for the 35th anniversary or the 40th anniversary. <laughs> so so I, I still say, hey, you could do it in some form if you wanted, but for the credibility punk rock uh, sake, you did the right thing. I think so. I mean, we came up as punk rockers that, you know, just happened yeah. to get, you know, a, a big record deal and everything that happens after that. But I agree. I think sometimes it's just classier and cooler, but you know, people have to, you know, they have to live the life they want to live. They have to pay their bills. And, you know, sometimes that is, that's their only option, you know, to do that. But in our case, you know, Mark had a successful solo career. I was producing albums and working on projects all over the world. Van, right. and, Van and Lee married and had families and had, you know, kind of young kids, you know, it's like they had, and they had their own lives, you know, it just wasn't in the cards for us to do that. So in terms of being the early punk rock band, most people I talk to of a certain age were into Kiss and Van Halen, and then they got into punk rock. Are you cut from that cloth too? No, I the completely different cloth. <clears throat> I was totally into jazz, and my first record collection was my grandparents' collection of 78s of old big band and swing. So, And I played jazz all through you know, junior high and high school, and I got a scholarship to college and played jazz in college. And I was into... I would say indie rock, like more than punk, you know, it's not like I was a hardcore punk guy, but like I loved all the SST stuff and all the independent stuff that was coming out. And of course I, like I had this great aunt who was a record collector. And so she'd give me records, but they were classic records. So the first record batch of records she gave me was Elton John, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, The Who, Tommy, Rolling Stones, Let It Bleed. Um, Bob Dylan, uh, Blood on the Tracks. You know, it was like classic records. So, and of course, I love Van Halen. You know, like, how can you not love Van Halen? They're awesome. But that's not an early influence on me. It was really jazz and, and just independent music in general. That uh, jazz to punk rock thing, the records that you mentioned actually happened to Jim Ward from At The Drive-In in Sparta too. Oh, There's really? A... Well, At The Drive-In is an amazing band. So that's pretty cool if that was his influence, too. A few people that happened with where they were way too young to be into swing music, but they inherited somebody's record yeah. collection and they yeah. learned too many chords. And then eventually uh, they <laughs> simplified with punk rock. So cool to hear that to you. Uh, that's, yeah. that's funny you'd say that because, I, you know, I'm a drummer, songwriter, composer. And, and I would, I'd come up and people would be like, what is that chord progression that you've come up with? And it's because of that jazz, you know, big band influence. Totally. Wow. Okay. I, I being, before I let you on your way, two quick questions. Yeah. And I'll let you go. And the, the first one is the book is new to us. I know as a person who wrote a book that I turned in a year and a half ago, and it's not out for another two months. It's an old project for you. Uh, and this tour was booked months ago. Do you know what's coming up next for you in 2024? Do we just have to wait and see and keep checking Instagram? Well, I mean, the main thing that I'm working on is this music series, which I'm also promoting at the same time as the book. So I have a new music series called Singing Earth, which is on the Vivo channel, which is great because you can watch it on your big screen TV through your Roku device, or you can watch it on YouTube. And probably there's lots of places where people can find it. And the first episodes are being finished right now as far as the editing goes. But it's me going around the world and interviewing musicians and talking to them about their process. And then we also usually do some kind of live performance or a recording session. So 
the first few episodes are me in the Peruvian Amazon with the singing Shipibo shamans, and I'm recording them in the rainforest. And then we're in Brazil, and I'm working with all these really amazing Brazilian musicians in studio sessions. And then there's an episode about the last living Delta blues singer from the original generation of blues singers in the Mississippi Delta. There's a episode about Seattle. There's an episode about the Alaskan Arctic, which includes that that sailboat team that I was telling you about because we sailed to Alaska and then I go up and work with the indigenous people up there. So I'm, I'm going to be working on that all through next year. Uh, I've already started writing another book. Um, I ha- I don't know when it'll come out, but uh, I have, I've developed kind of a, a pace for this and I'll do it as long as I'm able to do it. So, hmm. so and, kind of- and I'm always producing records all the time, but like, producing records for somebody you're kind of like the alan lomax of the of seattle indie scene without the shady business practice or confusion right about right stuff. exactly well yeah i mean I, I mean i mean i went to graduate school to study ethnomusicology so we studied yes. alan lomax but one of the i'll tell you one of the most important things you learn when you really study this is you learn an ethics uh about how you do this so for example Anytime I've recorded it, indigenous people, we always give them the archive and like, this is yours. It's your intellectual property. Here's an archive of everything recorded. So you can have, you remember the stories of your elders. I mean, when I was in Alaska, I was recording stories for uh, Gwich'in elders that were 80 and almost 90 years old. And so now there's an archive of their storytelling for, you know, whatever they want to use it for. And in the Amazon rainforest, the same thing. I've produced albums for these shamans down there, and a hundred percent of the money goes to the shamans. It doesn't go to me. I'm I'm the I'm the producer and the creator and the the helper is more what I am. So you learn how to do that. You know, there's there's kind of a practice that you learn as you do it, but you also learn you know all that all the legal stuff about intellectual property and ownership and and the the right and ethical way to do those things. Also, oh. you, only, you only do them when you're invited to do them. You know, they invite you to come and do this. So I'll revise my compliment slash label and say you're Lomax meets Peter Gabriel. Because if you look at the real world records and what he did with bringing light to world music in a mainstream way, or at least with major distribution, kind yeah. of what he did, but all Barrett all the time. And the last question, this is intended to be a compliment. So I look at the master's degree and the Vivo series, and the books, and all that. It's all smart stuff. Is there anything dumb that you're into? Do you have any (laughs) hobbies that don't require a high IQ? I I don't think I have a high IQ. I think I just am one of those people. I mean, I have, like, studied, and I, you know, I went to music school. Let me rephrase. (laughs) Do Do you ever go through YouTube and watch videos of people falling down? Do you like any physical comedy? Do you like anything that's not intellectual yeah I, i'm sure i do but i'll be honest i don't spend time on youtube i i i know people like spend hours on there and i i've just never been pulled into that i mean every now and then i'll watch a movie trailer because i want to see like the trailer but i truly am so busy and i love what i do i use technology i mean we i have like very high tech technology when i'm doing field recordings because i'm running on battery power and doing digital recordings and you know, you have to have technology to do that. But um, somebody was saying to me at one of our shows, um, <laughs> they're like, you should get a T-shirt that says, um, you know, uh, what? How, how did he say it? Um, uh, Barrett Martin Music, make yourself smarter. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so no energy drinks for you like this? <laughs> no, I can't. I'm, I'm drinking coffee, you know, like I'm, I'm old school, black coffee. And just sit at your writing station and work, write your book or go into the studio and don't, you know, monkey around, write a great song and record it and put it out. Stop in the nonsense, you know. So, yeah, I, I, there's probably stuff that I've that I've liked. that's probably kind of dumb. And I'm not trying to avoid the question. I just can't really think of anything off the top of my head. But. I like the idea of music and and art and and literature and film making people smarter. I like that as a as a kind of a 
a directional thing that I'm that I'm going for. So when I work with people and produce an album for them, or if I'm doing my own album or some collaboration, yeah, I want to make it as smart and cool and interesting as, as possible. Um, because unfortunately, the world we live in, mediocrity and averageness sells really well. You know, the stuff you hear on the radio, it's look, it's not a secret. It's paid to be on there. You know, payola is still real. That stuff gets on the radio. And so people start to think, oh, that's the highest benchmark is what I'm hearing on the radio. I'm like, no, that's the lowest. It's just, you know, they paid to put it on there. You know, I think you just came up with your next book title. Averageness sells really well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the but the bottom line is thank you for the decades of great contributions to the arts, to education, et cetera. And really looking forward to whatever is coming next from you and Team Barrett. Thank you so much. Pleasure speaking with you. Outro cast. <laughs>